I'm Matt Medved, co-founder, CEO, and editor-in-chief of NFT Now. And this is Beyond Buzzwords, community building in the digital era. We got some incredible panelists. To kick things off, I'm just gonna bounce around, give you guys each an opportunity to give a brief intro on who you are, and then we will jump into everything. Dave, you wanna start? We'll work our way through. Sure, thank you so much for having me here. It's, uh, it's always such a, you know, invigorating experience to be in real life with uh, the community. Uh, my name is Dave Krugman. I'm a cri crypto artist and photographer. Uh, I also am the founder of a creative community based out of uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn called All Ships. It's dedicated to the idea that a rising tide raises all ships and uh, you know these technology layers really unlock that reality for us creators. So really excited to be here and dive into this conversation with these uh, luminaries over here. Hi, uh, my name is Elroy, one of the co-founders of ARC, also the CEO. Um, Arc is a reimagination of communities. Some people say private member club in a, in a more online and scal scalable manner while pushing the Web3 space in Asia forward together. Um, I think we have a very, very interesting community. All our members are curated from the ground up. So right now we have about 430 members. I would say that we are probably Asia's number one Web3 collective right now, uh, just because of who's in our community. Um, I wouldn't name drop names, but um, on to you, Frank. Hey, um, my name is Frank. I uh, started this project called The Gods. It's an NFT project and uh, Utes as well. <laughs> hey, I'm G Money, uh, founder of Admit One and 90CC. There it is. So community is a word that gets used a ton in the space, right? It's almost become a buzzword, but it is also this pillar upon which the space is really founded. It's where the value tends to flow from and to. I'd love to hear from each of you. You each have started your own communities, in some cases, multiple communities. What does community mean to you? And, and what, does that, like, what does that mean in a Web3 context? Um, so to me, community is, is one of the most important you know, words it is, it is like, you know, relentlessly used and people, you know, roll their eyes at it. But really what community means to me is that community is the root of all value. Um, money, tokens, whatever you call it, is really a technology to move value through space and time. So if you like strip everything away and you go back to the like basics, I think that what community represents is kind of value, like value creation and storage. Um, and I think what's interesting about Web3 and this, these technology layers is that these tools have given us a way to kind of separate out community from audience. Like social media, pure web two stuff is really an audience based system. But when you can kind of issue tokens to a community that become like a binding force and a sense of alignment mechanism, um, you really get to like separate your passive audience from your deeply committed like two way communication community. And you know, since I, I think that uh, community is the root of all value, these tools can be used to create a tremendous amount of value for the different like, ecosystems of community that we're all trying to build and, and uh, you know, create symbioses with these technologies. I think for me, um, crypto, especially NFTs, um, it's a flow of not only capital, but a sense of belonging. So what that means is that you have uh, int extrinsic mo motivations in terms of monetary, but also definitely intrinsic. So definitely you can't just focus on a singular va value stream that's monetary. Um, for us at ARC, um, we harp on, we are very focused on, on, on going back to basics, traditional community building models. So I think what we're all trying to achieve here is not product market fit. We are trying to achieve community market fit. And because community and products intertwine, you gotta first do that, create, create the ideal community experience. And you do that by identifying who your members are, curating who your members are, understanding their needs, their wants, their motivations, and what, what does value mean to them. And after you do that, you put in an incentivization scheme of sorts, very similar to what Frank did with uh, um, PowerPoints, you know. And that will create a flywheel that will forever trap them in the middle of a funnel. So it's a, it's a shift from a linear funnel to a non-linear funnel. So in a linear funnel, you actually have to open your funnel at the top, right? And you, you push your, 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 your users all the way down until they ultimately buy a product from you. But this can't happen in Web3 because if you, if you push them all the way down, they escape your funnel, attention is gone. So the idea is that you have to retain them in the middle of the funnel consistently. And you can only do that through designing the ideal community experience that your members want. Um, but that's just my thoughts, yeah. And that's how we approach it at ARC. That's a banger. Um, I always said, when we first started the guys, I would always say like the community is bullshit 
And then way later on, um, after trying a lot of things that were utility driven and like trying to bring this like logical value to the to the project, yeah, you know, I realized it's all bullshit except for the community. And even most recently, uh, we obviously did this. Uh, we did this thing where we got Kraken to buy a Tesla and uh, give it to it. Like we we did you know this thing where someone in the community could win one, and it was a five day promotion. And it's interesting because over five days. For the cost of a Tesla, we generated 32 million impressions with like 8,000 unique posts over those five days. And to your point on community and, and the funnel, it's really interesting because NFTs are this unique place where you have this group of people that truly do have aligned incentives. And I think when broadly, when people ask me, what's the point of Web3? I just say two words, aligned incentives. And that's what I think allows you to create new models. Um, but I also think there's a lot left to figure out. And I think today, uh, we have a mix of people that appreciate art, that people that are deeply financialized and look at them purely as financial instruments, and that is not aligned incentives. And so I think that you know it's not about picking one or the other, but it's about clarity for yourself as a team, but also uh, how you pass that on to the community as well. And that to me is what like good community building looks like over time. And it's not a one-time thing; it's a constant reinforcement. Yeah, and I, you know, I think everybody on stage had, had really good points. And I think to that I'll add is, I, I think community is focused values, right? And to what Frank was just saying is, you know, you're going to have your financial players, you're going to have your people that are there, like for the vibes, right? That are there because they like the community. And I think the key that every community has to do each each one individually is say, this is what we're here for, right? Like it's not necessarily like you're here for the flippers. I don't, I don't think anybody on this stage is building a community for flippers, right? Cause they're, they ultimately enter the community with their eye on the exit. Like that's not a valuable community member. And I think that's one of the things that I think the community as a whole, NFTs has, has had that learning curve, right? Of saying, you know, people that said that they were there for the art, turns out they were there for the money. And now when the money is no longer there, that's when you're gonna see like true community form. So I think right now is definitely a very important part of the cycle where you're gonna see, I think new business models come up, new ways of engagement come up. You know, I think what, what D Gods is doing has been incredible in terms of community building um, impressions, you know, like I didn't know that stat about 32 million impressions. Can like that's amazing right it's crazy yeah. yeah and and so like you know you're, you're gonna start seeing people tinker around with these things and i think that that's where um you know the seeds of the next bull market are born completely agree completely agree i think at its heart community building is really about building something bigger than yourself which is really e it's, it's it's easier said than done right like it's not all about dave and elroy and frank and g it's about all ships and ARC and D-Gods and Utes and Admit One and 9DCC. And the process of doing that is really challenging. Um, I'm curious for each of you, what were some of the biggest challenges or lessons learned along the road to building your communities? I think that, you know, one of the, there's so many things I could say here, but I think I want to focus on the idea of kind of just how much of yourself you can give. <laughs> um, I think one of the true things about building in this space is, that if you, you know, if you provide value before you ask for value, you never have to ask. So I think a good way to approach building community is to pour a lot of energy, resources, and help into, into your community. You can think of your community as almost like a battery. And like, the more you charge that battery in those moments where you need to like extract energy, there's a lot more there. But you know, if, you put, if you put too much of yourself out there and like approach levels of burnout and stress, I mean, I, I bet, I imagine I can speak for everyone here, everyone on stage, that like it, you can get to this point where you're like not saving enough of that energy for yourself and for your, you know for your your sanity and your mental health. Um, and so as you you know race in a in a hyper competitive environment to solidify your community and, and scale your community, I would just say one of the challenges is that you need to be very aware of uh, you know protecting your energy a bit and making sure that you have enough of yourself left to, to create something sustainable for you and your, your community that you're, you're working on. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think uh, my life has completely changed after doing ARC. Um, for us at ARC as well, like we, we, the hardest thing for me at ARC right now is we always want to have a minimum of 20% active contributors in ARC. And it's uh, a little bit dif uh, difficult for us because our members are a little bit more high level uh, we have founders, we have the founders of the top 
C-suites of the top protocols, market makers, billionaires, people like hopefully you guys down the line, but you know, very similar, right? Founder of Nansen, right? all of them, right? Everyone in Asia, most of the, the top dogs are in art. So it's hard to get actually this type of people to actually contribute because they're busy. Um, so for us, you know, even after I bring them in the community, how do I align them in purpose? For me, I think building community, you, you just need to do two things really well. Just two things, but these two things are super hard. Number one is alignment of purpose. Why are they in your community? Number two is, um, you need a regular, you need a heightened frequency of touch with your members. I was actually asked to be a director of a TEDx in Singapore recently. And um, so one, the, 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 the female that, that, that owns the IP is also my member. So I asked her, right, um, what's the difference between ARC, community building and ARC, and community building and TEDx? She was like, oh, right, um, once a month, I send a newsletter. Um, every half a year or a quarter a year, I do a big event for them. Once in a while, I send messages to Rara them. But for ARC, it's very different. We built a community infrastructure, an online a digital community infra infrastructure on both iOS and Android. So our Discord is on an app. And by doing that, you're actually fighting for attention uh, with 100 over other apps that are your members' phones as well. And these are high-level people, right, who actually don't want to be bothered by notifications, stuff like that. How do I actually bring them in? How do I capture their retention, uh, attention? How do, I, how do I make them remain in the middle of the funnel consistently? This is something that we're still working on. Um, 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 I guess for a lot of our members, we have already achieved pro, uh, community market fit, but I don't want to rest there as well. And it's hard because it's a consistent thing that you have to do every day. Um, and I think it's going to take over the rest of my life. Man, you're man, you're you're crushing it. Um, that was sick. I think I think I'll take another angle here. Uh, you know, I definitely get and see a lot more of the degeneracy uh, in the ecosystem. You know, that's how the PFP game goes. Um, and and I find like there's a lot of people, whether they're like full grown adults with families or kids that are like just getting NFTs, that for the first time um, are feeling an intense amount of stress and uh, anxiety. And on the internet, when you have anonymous kind of cartoon JPEGs as your identity, uh, they'll, they'll take it out on you, right? All day, every day. And so in terms of, you know, the most difficult part is, is just staying calm and like recognizing that people are at the end of the day outwitting a lot of different emotions and feelings onto you. And sometimes there's really good ideas in there. Sometimes there's like, you know, just it's, it gets pretty dark and depressing. And so more than anything, I think, you know, being stressed or anxious is like the default in the space and like trying to just stay calm and like try to understand what are people saying? You know, there's so many different opinions on everything and just filtering out what makes sense to you and then trying to operational and operationalize that and uh, just keep moving. I think that's a big part of our success, honestly, is uh, most people just did not think that we would just keep going. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that continues to be the game plan. But that was a tough learning lesson, just feeling all these people <laughs> outwitting their fucking life story and their deep, deep emotions onto you, whether it's in public or in DMs. And uh, yeah, you just see another side of people, honestly. It teaches you a lot. Yeah, I, and you know, to add, I think all the comments on stage have been really, really insightful. Uh, I guess the points I'll add to kind of build on some of the stuff that was said was, one is, I, I mean, I remember when I first launched Admit One, and the price skyrocketed like way more than I ever imagined it would. Like I woke up and I threw up every morning, like just dry heaves, because like the amount of pressure that's on you where people are like, all right, but well, what are you gonna do to send this to 100 ETH? I'm like, bro, I didn't think this would get past like one ETH. Like what, like, you know, the fact that we're, we're here and having this convo um, and people expect everything from you, right? There, it's, it's more, it's just more intense than let's say running a public company even, right? Because it's like, people are like, why aren't you up 24 seven? Why aren't you working on the weekends? Like, why aren't you in Twitter spaces 24 seven? And like, people just keep on demanding. So I think uh, one of those lessons is like, it's funny because when I, when I talk to people and they're like, oh, I want to launch an NFT project. I'm like, bro, you better be all in because if you're not, like this is, 
you're, you're, it's not going to be worth it, right? And so um, I, I think that that was probably one of the biggest lessons that I learned. Uh, but interesting, you know, to build on what Elroy said was, you know, about how do you keep members engaged, right? Because I, I have that same issue in Admit One, right? Where we have a lot of founders, a lot of creators, a lot of builders that have their own stuff, right? Their own things that they're, they're working on. You know, Dave is, is a member of A1 and he obviously is working on his stuff. So, you know, I, I would never blame him for not being active in the community. And it, it's funny, like, cause you have, I, I think it's like a spectrum of people that have a lot of money, but not a lot of time to the other end of the spectrum where people that have a lot of time, but not a lot of money, right? And then everything in between. And it's really, it's like, how do you find that, you know, like you said, keep them in the middle of that funnel and keep them engaged? Because there's some people, and it, the way I, I kind of handled it is if there's a conversation, let's say something about street photography in New York, right? Very specific, I'll be like, I'll just like ping Dave directly and I'll be like, hey, look, people are talking about this, maybe you want to hop in on this conversation because I know he's busy and I know he's doing his own thing. But like, these are all like learning processes that we're, we're figuring out as we go along. And, you know, like, I, like, you know, every time, like I see somebody like announcing something, you know, I always am watching what, what D gods is doing. And I'm like, look, if they do something that's really cool, like we're, we're going to implement that into our ecosystem too. Right. And vice versa. Cause I think we're all learning here from people being like, that's a good idea. How do we implement that here? And then, you know, it's, it's, I think that, that um, the iterations of all these ideas is really what's going to lead to like that product market fit that's all of a sudden going to click for consumers and your people all of a sudden Web3 is going to be part of everybody's everyday lives. Yeah, no, those are excellent insights across the board. Thank you all. Um, Dave, you know, you're unique on stage as, a, as an artist yourself. And you have done, I think, a really admirable job of building community around your artistic practice. Um, from your one of ones to uh, projects like Drive that pr promote community engagement uh, to Drip Drop and your most recent release, Rolls. I know you have a, a whole thesis to this. Like this is, none of this is accidental and you're, and you're very intentional about how you grow your community through these projects. Can you walk us through that dynamic? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, pretty, pretty brief because there's so much to talk about here. But I think one thing that I'm really excited about with this technology is it allows me to do so much more with so much less in the sense that I would rather have a thousand collectors than 10 million followers, like for real because the followers are a very passive, kind of just like one-way communication, but, but those 1,000 collectors are like, you know, can, if you, you know, for Drip Drop, for example, if I can sell 1,000 images at 0.2, I mean, that's, you know, 200 ETH, which can allow me to have creative runway for a long, long time to, to execute my next ideas. But I think the way I think about making art in this ecosystem, and I think this applies to PFPs or to, to you know, other types of um, token gated groups, is digital, bio, uh, like digital biology. And the way, like I love that you're using words like evolution and iteration and, and all of that, because it's really important. So I think that basically, when you think about building these like organic but digital almost life forms that live on their own, there's ways to give them energy so they can keep surviving. So one example is my project Drive, which I released in 2021. Um, I dropped uh, a project that had 111 cars. They kind of look like Hot Wheel collectibles. Um, it was, represents 10 years of photography all over the world. But I decided that I was going to hold back like a large section, a large chunk of the supply. So I held back 20 trophy cars, which were like the most interesting, you know, unique, rare cars in the collection. And I sold 91 cars and I said, okay, every couple months, so that I could extend like the longevity and, and the energy in this project. I was like, I will airdrop one of these rare tokens to somebody who submits an image in the style of drive to our race. And so it's almost like Fast and the Furious, like drag racing. Like, and every time I do that, I'm able to like re-inject life into, into this thing that I've built. And then that can sustain a project over years. And I think that, you know, what's happened with Drive, you know, we still have 11 races left after a couple years. And uh, I think that every time I do one of those races, it like, it really pushes the project forward. It reminds people what I'm doing. It allows people to, 
you know, it incentivizes people to tap into their own creativity. And like, I've had people texting me at least once a week for all, this entire time, sending me pictures of cars in their city, being like, here's a drive car, here's a drive car, I'm saving it for the race. And I've even had people be like, you've changed the way I see the world. And like, I didn't think I could be an artist. I didn't think I could be a photographer. And now I'm constantly looking for that. And just to close, I think the last thing I'll say about that is the beauty of the blockchain is that it's, it creates this executable data layer. And I had this you know, ring theory of community building where when I decided to drop drip drop uh, and 10X you know, my supply of, of tokens out there, I went to the drive community and I'm like, if you hold a drive car, like you get a free mint of my next thing. And basically it's a thank you and it's a way to perpetuate that original core, that like burning life force at the center of your ecosystem and be like, okay, now like you, you kind of, are made good on your original investment and can continue to propagate the ideas and, and that digital ecosystem out across the landscape. And then as you scale, you can just keep adding rings and each one of those rings feeds outward. And then I try to find ways to feed back in, like feed it back in and create this upflow and, and, and downflow of uh, community interaction and engagement. But I can't really do that without these digital objects that I think we're so lucky to have as, as creators and artists in this, in this new ecosystem. Absolutely. I, lo I love that explanation. Frank, I know you recently navigated a bit of a challenging community sentiment around the launch of D-God Season 3. Uh, you made the decision to pivot and to, to downgrade uh, the art rather than upgrade it. And I thought that you did a great job of communicating directly with your community, which is something that like, I point to you as an example of a founder who does a great job of that in Web3. Can you talk us through how you rise and meet like, challenging moments like that as a founder and, and sort of decide how to address them in that way? Yeah, I think, uh, like, I, I'm like an internet kid. I grew up uh, just using internet forums, talking about whether it's my favorite movies, music, whatever it is, and ma actually made a lot of friends on the internet. And so for me, it's like, there's this element of, the truth is always gonna come out. Like, there's, there's a level of objectivity. Um, and so if there's like an overwhelming sentiment, like, uh, hey, we don't like this thing, or we don't want this, I feel like my radar on how legit that is, is is pretty good. Like if people really don't like something versus if a few people are complaining. And so part of, you know, yeah, like things didn't go super well with season three, but man, I can't even count the number of times with D-Gods, even with Utes, where things are like going super well, we mess something up, we listen, we figure it out, and then we're and, and we're back to where we were before, if not, if not bigger. And it's just been like a loop of this for the last two years. And so I honestly do enjoy that that part of the process where we put something out and people have my 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 hope honestly is we always get visceral reactions, you know, because a lot of people now don't know this, but like the first five, six months of D Gods, nobody like gave a shit about us. Like we were like labeled a dead project. I was tweeting all the time, just trying to get people to even pay attention when D Gods were like 200 bucks. And so for me, I have a deep appreciation for the, pa for the fact that people even care. Um, and so for me, I, I just never want to lose that. And I think that we consistently just keep listening and then taking all the data that we take in and we just make an independent decision um, after that. But yeah, I just think it's important. Um, uh, otherwise, you know, what's the point, right? N NFTs versus just strictly like buying something from somebody. Uh, you have to listen, but I think to a degree, you know, you can't make a decision based on, you know, thousands of people's opinions, uh, but you, you, you definitely can use that to color your, the full spectrum of, of making that decision. But I don't know, it's something that's been pretty natural to me. Like, just tweeting stuff, you know, I don't like really overthink it, which has been uh, bad in many, in many scenarios, but also, also good. So um, yeah, that, that's my philosophy on it. It's a internet's like this living, breathing organism, communities like this living, breathing organism. And to, to your point, you know, it is that core group of diehard people that ultimately end of the fucking day really matter. So when things go poorly, I'm, I'm looking and checking in on what the, that core group is saying. And if, if they're still riding, like that means I know I didn't fuck, fuck anything up that bad. <laughs> and if those guys always feel taken care of and we continue to grow concentrically from there, uh, I think we're gonna continue the path that we've been on for the last two years consistently, which is just, you know, continuing to grow. So, yeah.
I love that perspective. I love the perspective. I'm sure everyone uh, building community can relate to those moments where uh, where you have to deal with the community sentiment and navigating out the right way. Um, gee, with 90CC, you know, you're building a digitally native fashion brand um, that, that has these connected products with the that bridges physical and digital. In doing so, like, how do you navigate sort of the tension between exclusivity and accessibility in being able to build something like that around a community? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because it's I think. It's very similar to crypto, right? And somebody said this once, and I think this was the perfect analogy for crypto, is crypto is the, it's the most capitalistic, socialistic experiment you can run into. And, and that to me, I'm like, yeah, like I fuck with that. Like that makes so much sense. And I think it's the same thing. And I think what I'm dealing with is the same thing that any brand deals with, right? Is like, how do you get your core customer to be a certain base? but then also, you know, create something that people want to be a part of, right? And like, I just thought of myself uh, and like the brands that I like to associate with before I even launched 90CC is that, you know, if I could buy a t-shirt for five bucks, and I think this is like the same thing with NFTs in general, right? It's like, if I could buy a t-shirt for five bucks, you gotta take it for granted, right? If there's like a million t-shirts and I can buy them whenever I want, you're like, yeah, whatever, I'll just buy it whenever. But if it's something that's super exclusive, that maybe is something special, you don't wear it every day, you wear it on special occasions, you cherish it more, right? And it's, I think it's the same thing that we see in the NFT market, right? And it's just kind of like, how do you create that, you know, they, it's called mimetic desire, right? Where people want something that other people want. And I think that that's what we've been trying to figure out. I think everybody on this stage has been trying to figure that out as well, right? Is create something that people want to be a part of, but then also after a certain point, it's still accessible, right? Because I mean, I, I think we all probably want mass adoption on this stage. And you know, you're, every, everybody on this stage is selling a luxury product, right? And it's a luxury good. And you kind of need to think about it that way. And then also kind of have that way that people can enter into the community at an, a more affordable price point. So this is stuff that I think about all the time. Um, yeah, I'm sure everybody on this stage thinks about it all the time, um, but it's, it's a very interesting problem for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that ties really well into my question for you, Elroy, which is in, in building ARC, you know, you're, you're based in Singapore, but you're building a global network, um, you know, that transcends many different regions, obviously largely based in the APAC region. Um, how have you sort of navigated community building across these different markets, especially, you know, in keeping that a very curated community, um, in, also in light of the recent Stellar's launch? That's a very good question, but um, all I can say that is we are laser focused on doing things that don't scale. So, you know, there was all the curation matter and everything. Art knew from day one that we had to curate all members. We had to know every single member like a friend. I, I have a very privileged friend, um, super privileged, and he came down to Singapore like two, two, two months ago, uh, two Grand Prix ago. So he, this guy can get into anywhere he wants, right? Any party he wants because of who he is. And I asked him like, which party are you going to? I was, he was like, um, going to uh, this private members club networking night. I was like, why? Like you can get into anywhere you want, why this place, right? Anyway, he said it was fun, it's fun, but it also solves his, because uh, he's in his growth stage of his life and he's trying, he's, he's, he, he wants to meet good people, right? Uh, people that can add value to his life. So I, I, I found that still weird. By the way, I, I had a meeting with uh, that private member club this year. Right? So I asked the community managers, like, what's the secret sauce? Right? He was, they were like, Elroy, we have 1,800 members, but he takes out a big black book. They know every single thing about their member, what he likes, what type of girl he likes, what type of alcohol he likes, blah, blah, blah. So during that, that networking, networking night, um, 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 they crafted out very well synergies, uh, seating arrangements, so that they get their, the attendees actually get, their, their, get what they want. They just want to go, they want to meet, they want to have a good, good time at dinner, they want to go back home with, a, with good contacts on their phone. That's it, right? So for us at ARC, we do the same as well. My calendar used to be open to all my members. I meet my members all the time. My lunches, my dinners, um, 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 my weekends are spent with my members. Obviously, right now, I gotta put that to a stop, right? But it has worked so far, right? Um, in terms of like reaching out to, uh, to overseas regions, um, we are focusing on, on, on Asia first. I think we already dominated Singapore. 
um, next off, we're going for an Asian expansion. Um, I don't have an answer right now, actually, but um, all I can say is that we we just yeah. Sorry, I'm drawing a blank. I'm still hanging over this fuck. Sorry. Um, <laughs> that was banger, bro. You're spitting bars right now. That's crazy. <laughs> but in short, right? Yeah, it's really doing things that don't scale and really knowing your members. Like even uh, just referring to what G said just now, right? Um, we has high level members that don't 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 contribute, right? Because they have no time. For us, we know that, right? So it's going back to basics. We have two audience personas in ARC, confident thrivers and interesting risers. Confident thrivers are people who have achieved relative success in their lives. They are usually older, uh, they are very time starved. So what they'll contribute to the community is ideas, networks, resources, and capital. How do I get them to actually contribute to ARC? I need to give value to them. So my members are high, high, high value people. So what do they want? I need to help them with their business. I need to help them raise money. I need to, you know, find them partners. Like what I do for you guys. I told Ali, right? Why am I helping you guys so much? Because right, every time you guys come to Singapore, I'll go and meet you guys. I'll have long conversations with you guys. I'll take you guys out, wherever you guys need. I do it for you guys. There's an agenda. I want to retain you in the middle of the funnel. If I do that for you, you owe me the favor, right? So on the other end of the spectrum, we have what we call interesting risers. So interesting risers are more younger, growth-minded uh, individuals um, because they're so hungry for, uh, for growth. So what they want is usually um, validation. So what they contribute to the community is expertise and time. So for us at ARC, we know that we have these two types of members. Um, and it's, it's a lot of work, engaging them all the time, you know, uh, finding out their needs once. I remember listening to a call one, uh, a space once that Frank was, um, this 47 year old tech guy was telling you to, to, to do a Google form to find out what expertise your members are. So we do all of that locally, abroad as well. We haven't done it with you guys yet because we're already friends, right? So I don't need to do that for you to do you. But, um, but yeah, it's really doing things that don't scale. Like, um, I went a bit off tangent, I'm sorry, man. I'm just, just, yeah, I feel like puking. Uh, <laughs> no, you're great, yeah, you're great. great. I, I wish I always spoke that eloquently when I was hungover, you know? <laughs> no, great, great stuff. So one thing I'd love to chat about, um, the, the Web3 market, the NFT space, has changed a lot since we launched NFT Now in January 2021, right? The rise of Blur, the disappearance largely of, of creator royalties as a consistent and reliable revenue stream for projects um, has been one of the most significant, I think, shifts in, in, uh, in, both, the, in, in both the economic and community landscape of, of this space. I'm curious, like, how has that changed the, the realities of, of building community in Web3? Yeah, I think um, you know, there was a time when there was a lot more people in Web3, and at that time, the narrative was like, yo, let's go onboard millions of people, let's go onboard the next billion people. And uh, today, there's less than 10,000 daily active people in Web3 broadly. And so I think, uh, you know, that is that should not be the narrative anymore. Like, let's get to 20,000. I've been talking about this for a while. Like, if we're at 10,000, let's double it before we're talking about a million. Um, and to your point about doing things that don't scale, it's, uh, I think that the idea of whether it's mass adoption, whether it's like we need to decrease all the friction and somehow that's gonna mean people are gonna wanna, you know, buy NFTs or buy crypto, uh, it's just so utopic and, and no longer the reality. And the reality now is like, we need to just retain people better. I, my, my analogy I'll put to this is, let's just say you have like a leaky fucking lifeboat and uh, you know, you're telling everyone on the lifeboat, like, let's not patch the holes. Like, let's go get a million people to come in. It's like, what's about to happen? I'm about to sink, I'm about to be the boat and the Titanic. Um, so I think we, we just need to fix the retention problem and, and keep people here and make it better for the people that are still here um, before we talk about onboarding a lot of people because a lot of things got massaged over um, when ETH is hitting $4,800 and everyone's just super fucking uh, euphoric. And now you look at it and it's like, ah, like it's, yeah, NFTs are pretty mid right now. It's like crypto, it's not that exciting right now. We're losing users every day. So I'm just a big believer in like, uh, you know, week over week growth. Like what do we need to do to retain people? And like, let's not, let's not talk crazy right now. It's, it's not the move, yeah. I think just specifically, I, I really love what you have to say there. Like that, I'm gonna borrow that analogy about the lifeboat. <laughs> that's, that's really good. Um, but to take another angle, just on the royalty side of things, like the, the original promise when I started minting in 2020 was like, 
oh, like if I can put out, you know, really good projects that trade at a certain level, I can have like a kind of um, uh, steady passive income that, that I can like live off like on the royalties, almost like a, you know, if you were a famous musician or something like that. But then, you know, as reality set in and we realize that this isn't at a contract level guarantee, it's kind of a social contract, um, I think that was a, a harsh reality. And it was, you know, royalties are why so many artists join the space. And as that kind of disintegrates, um, I think that, again, we have a problem with retention because people are like, oh, but we thought, you know, it's a bait and switch. And so I think what it's done is it's taken away some of that, that engine. Um, a couple ways that I think we can deal with this. One is the separation of um, like art and collectibles in the sense that like NFTs are the underlying technology, but there's so many different asset classes that are built on that substrate. And I think by putting them all in one bucket, we, we are unable to kind of optimize each one for what we need to do if we want to enforce social contracts. So I think like making it clear that there's different ways to use this technology in the same way, like NFTs are just digital objects. Think about all the ways that we use different objects in the real world. All of those apply in digital social spaces as well. So I think leaning into that narrative and just explaining that like digital objecthood means that we can do real world things in online spaces is, is a way to do this. One thing I've done personally for my art, I did this with Drive as I described, like I, I, I held back um, some of those tokens so that I could use them as fuel to propel my community and to do interesting things and, and, and drive incentives within my communities. For Drip Drop, for example, I, you know, inspired by Snowfro who paused his squiggle mint, um, what he's been able to do with that remaining supply of squiggles over the past three years, I mean, he's done life changing things for individuals, for charities, for causes he cares about, uh, for institutional adoption, he's donated them to museums. So he had the foresight to um, you know, retain some of his, his own supply so that he could use it as an economic engine for his communities. So with Drip Drop, I, I withheld 10% of the supply and as the project grows and becomes more valuable, I can use like those, each one of those 100 incentive tokens becomes more and more of a powerful driver. So I just encourage creatives to think um, with the uh, reduction of royalty payments, what other ways can you use this technology to you know, build in that, that, that energy into your project that can propel it to new heights? So uh, just another way to look at it. Um, so speaking of context of art, right? So uh, art or myself, I really believe that all Web3 communities or 99% of Web3 communities, but three projects, Web3 communities are going to become social venture studios in the short to midterm. <laughs> Um, so I really believe in that. So in terms of art, uh, we don't even care about our royalties at all. Um, we don't care, we, we take it as a one-time fundraise. Um, I remember a quote by Li Jin. Uh, she's, she is the mother of the passion economy, you know, co-founder of, uh, co of Varian Fund. She says there's three ways to actually start um, Web3 social products. Number one is obviously protocol first, like Lens. Um, then you have that base, where it's like friend tech right now, forecaster. Um, and then the third way is community first. And she also says that after you, the community is created, the community is going to spawn projects, right? Where there's like media, where there's like, uh, I don't know, dropping new collections, starting a fund, like what, what we want to do at ARC. So for us at ARC, we look at, we look at revenue streams very differently. Uh, we have market agnostic revenue streams, meaning that they, these projects can actually create revenue for us in both a bear and a bull, but also bull market uh, revenue streams, meaning like, for example, creating another D-Gods. I can't do it in a bad market, right? I gotta I got do it in a good market. So yeah, I guess that's just my short answer. Um, I also just wanna note that ARC is a very, very different type of NFT project. Um, in the past, I was actually thinking, we were actually trying to raise money uh, on it based off uh, ERC20 token gating. Um, the difference right now is just that we are token gated with an NFT. Um, but with that in mind, uh, um, yeah, we, you, in short, we don't care about royalties, but I do know it's a big problem for, 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 for artists and all. I am fully supportive of royalties. I think that's bullshit that they don't have royalties. I think a lot of people don't know that even like in soccer, for example, for example um, if, a, if, a, if a player graduates from an academy like Manchester United Academy, every time he gets sold from every club, there's a perpetual, perpetual royalty back to the, the academy. So this happens already in the real world. 
You know, I think that no royalties are favoring the traders. I don't think they should be prioritized. It should be the creators. But yeah, just, just, just in short, yeah. One quick thing on that too, just really briefly is like, I think that royalties can work. Like it, what you just said about this other, you know, the, the club system of, of soccer players, for example, like where that, that's a social contract, you know? It's like a legal and social contract. It's not code is law. Like, we, I think this can still exist. And, you know, I have somebody helping me. I mean, I, mean, I want to pass it to G in a second because I think we, I'll say something that he's been doing really well. But, like, there's ways to incentivize your communities to respect royalties. And people, you know, despite royalties, um, you know, having this kind of enforcement problem, I'm getting, like, 60, 70 percent of people are paying my full royalties. And it's on my one of ones, like, every time. And on you know my my wider collections that trade more like like to like tokens, people are paying like because they they like the idea like it's like when you tip at a restaurant like if I even when I have like a a mid experience at a restaurant like it's, I'm still tipping twenty percent like that's how they make their money like it's such a it's such an enforced social contract that I don't even think twice about it at, at least in the U S I know there's no tipping here but but I think it's really interesting and I think G's done a really good job of like building these incentives systems with like points and, and different ways to, um, you know, make paying royalties, like, like gamify it, like have people earn status. Like look how effective airline miles programs are. That's not on chain. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's really uh, an interesting thing to think about. Um, like how can we still respect it without the direct enforcement? Yeah, I, it's, it's, uh, thanks for that, Dave. The, I've spent, it's funny, just to segue for a second on what you were talking about, Snowfro. I remember when he stopped minting the contract and he was like, yeah, I'm going to hand these out over the next few years. I was like, I'm like, these things are 30 bucks. Like, you know, what, what's those, you know, you're not, you're be handing them out to people and, and whatever. And then obviously now, like, he's, managed to obviously create something but i remember at that time i was like man who's like are you gonna give like somebody like a hundred of these and like imagine imagine you got a hundred of them like two years ago but um but yeah no i and i've spoken a lot with snowfro on this right of how do you how do you enforce royalties by leading with a stick and uh leading with a carrot instead of a stick right how do you get people to want to pay royalties and you know i, I wasn't aware of of the uh the manchester the manchester united academy stuff but like we see it all the time you see it in watches you see it in handbags you see it in luxury sports cars right where you know not necessarily royalties but if you buy something direct from the factory and you flip it like you're never getting anything direct from factory again right and i think part of it is the space is really small but I think as the space gets bigger, is it become easier to identify who paid royalties and who didn't, who is a valuable community member? Because I think at the end of the day, like I don't really care if somebody is a member of the community and they're trying to flip it and then they don't want to pay royalties. Like honestly, like that's not like a community member that I really want to, to make. I care whether they're happy or not, right? Like I want to care. I care about the people that are actually there, that are there for the right reasons. And that's like when they sell it or get into it or whatever, they're incentivized. Like, yeah, like I want to do this, right? Because I'm actually waiting for this meta. Maybe, maybe Frank, you're ready to start it. But I'm waiting for the meta of kind of saying how the actual people that are sitting there and are the gatekeepers and the to um, the the rent seekers are actually these you know, token holders that aren't play, paying royalties, right? Because it's almost like the, the pendulum is swinging the other way where as a creator, you know, people are like, well, what are you doing to create value? It's like, well, there's no incentive mechanism for me to create value if you're not going to pay a royalty when, you know, you come in or you exit. So I think it's really interesting, but I think part of it is, and this is what I've been experimenting with, with 90CC, is how do you create that people wanting to pay it, right? And that's kind of our whole concept behind network points of, you know, how do you make people proud, right? Like give people a badge of honor of like, I pay royalties, like do you, right? And like, that's that's where you need to go, not where it's like, oh yeah, code is law, because that doesn't work. Because at the end of the day, if, you know, if I'm sure, I think studies have been done where it's like, if you don't, if, if you think you can get away with something without being called out on it, you will get away with it. As long as you don't think you're gonna get called out on it. 
But if the exact opposite happens, then, you know, sky's the limit. So I think we just need to find those incentive mechanisms. One, one other really interesting thing um, I think that I would love to see a marketplace try is, is just flipping the royalty thing so that, that people who enter the system are paying royalties. Somebody who's exiting your ecosystem has no incentive to pay royalties. They're like, I don't have to deal with the consequences. So I would love to see somebody try that if anyone's out there that wants to. So Ma Magic Eden did this. Uh, they moved it to the buyer side, but it's like, People are just going to complain every, no matter what it is. And so I think that is, I, my, my take on it, and I have these tweets. I'm like, shit, I literally made it so only OpenSea, Blur, and all these guys could reply. Just let's call it tips. Like, and, and like if we use the same UX as like DoorDash, again, maybe more of a meme, but I think there's some truth to this. Like use the same UX as DoorDash where it's like gives you those kind of preset percentages and it's called a tip. You get a little confetti animation. I'm kind of like, I don't know, man. These guys are buying cartoon JPEGs. I think that there's going to be a percentage of people to do it. Uh, yeah, I think it's just like the concept today of royalties is just uh, we're just stuck in like a venture backed marketplace war. So if you think about it, it's like, why is this happening? Well, it's because, you know, you have massive actors in the space that aren't uh, aren't operating on any classic capitalistic principle. I mean, blur by definition is making zero percent, you know, on everything as well. And that's not like a business, right? It's, it's not like a proper business, but because it's venture backed and the game for that is just market domination, they're all playing in a game of market share. And so when blur does that, you know, it's like open sea at the end of the day, they're not gonna be able to raise their next round unless they continue to grow in market share. And if everyone's getting the cheapest buy price on, and, and best sell price on blur, then it's like open sea at a certain point has to decide, you know, how are we going to continue to grow? And so it's just like the tragedy of the, of the commons because you're operating in a non-rational ecosystem. And so it's just fucked uh, pretty, pretty much right now. I, I do think that a part of it is in a low liquidity environment, it's the pro traders ecosystem end of the day, right? It's not consumers ecosystem today as much just on the numbers. But I do think as traction comes back, each starts to run again, bull markets coming back. I do think that people will be very okay with, uh, paying percentages on buying and selling. It's just broadly, nobody's really making money in NFTs right now. And that ends up having an impact. If you have a 5% spread, the pro traders that are driving all the volume might not want to trade that thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I'm optimistic. Right. I mean, to, to build on your point, Dave, like I know Reservoir and, you know, I built my marketplace on top of Reservoir and, you know, we put that, you know, if, if the royalty doesn't want to be paid by the seller, like that royalty, like all prices reflect you know, paying, honoring those royalties on the marketplace, right? So I think you're gonna, you're gonna see that. I think as people try to own their own marketplace and their own experience, but to exactly what Frank said, at the end of the day, these marketplaces, they're venture backed. They need to get market share. They don't really, you know, they, and their end game is definitely different than like the NFT creators end game, so. I would love to see a combination of, of these ideas. Like I love the tipping percentages and like, you know, that fun gamification and then combine it with like a tiered status. So like a tied to your wallet address is some sort of badge. And then like as a creator, I could choose to do drops specific to like what level, like are you a, Let's a talk. are you like a platinum royalty payer? Then you can get like, you get like 50% off like a, a future drop that I'm doing. And I can choose as a creator to like basically like, token gate like a specific thing based on your you know social contribution yeah. to the space yeah. no that that's and that's kind of the thesis behind network points right exactly. it's just like yeah. you know i want to create this framework so that you as a creator can say all right well let's find these people that do honor royalties that have this uh reputation of doing so and then either give them limited access to something, giving them a discount or whatever, because then you as a creator now have, you're like, one, it's a good community member that obviously honors royalties and is probably somebody you want in your ecosystem anyway, right? 100%. Absolutely love this conversation. Um, I wish we could go a whole nother hour. Final question um, for each of you. You know, obviously when you launch a, uh, a, a project, a community-based project, you become accountable to that community. And that can take a, a personal toll on, on the founders, uh, each of you. Uh, I know I felt it since launching the Now Pass. You know, if you get a, a negative comment in Discord, it, it hits, right? It hurts you. Um, how, do you how do you manage that? How do you protect your mental health? How do you avoid burnout? And how do you stay grounded uh, in this climate? I, 
Um, I'm going to stay out of this because I'm still figuring out the solution. So I'm just going to listen. Yeah. I think we're all um, still figuring I, it out. I, I, I would definitely love to hear everybody else's uh, opinions on here, but I'll, I'll start with somebody gave me this analogy that really made sense to me. Because uh, again, like you, like I take everything personally. Like you, you comment something negatively online, like I see it and I'm like, fuck that. Like, you know, like I, I'm just, I take it personally. Um, and it's like, somebody's like, if you are the biggest band in the world and you're playing a 30,000 seat stadium, inevitably there's going to be people that don't like the concert and be like, that's the worst concert I ever went to. And there could still be 30,000 people that are there. This is the best concert ever, whatever. But you're on stage and you're playing to the crowd. You don't see those 10 people walk out the door. The good and the bad part about social media is you do see those 10 people that are walking out the door and they're very opinionated, right? And I think you just, a lot of it is kind of one, just learning to not take things so personally. Um, and, and two, just knowing it's like the law of large numbers. At some point, there is a group of people that won't like whatever you do for whatever reason. And that's okay. And you just have to kind of learn to live with it. It's much hard. It's much easier. It's much harder than it sounds. Right. Um, but I, and it's been a learning process for me because depending on the day, if I'm having a great day and somebody writes something negative, I'm like, yeah, whatever. But if I'm having a bad day, like, you know, it could spiral and, you know, I need to like sit down and meditate, right? Like take five minutes out of my day or whatever. But I think ultimately the fact that the greater community, and I think Frank had like a great comment around this is like, if you go to your core and they're fine, then you know you're, you didn't totally fuck up, right? Because there's, there's gonna be some people that just aren't totally aligned with your vision and, and that's okay, right? But if you go back to your core constituents and they're like, yeah, like, I, you got it, like, I believe in you. And then it's like, all right, cool, like, I made the right decision. But it's a learning process that I've been going through and I'm sure everybody on this stage has. Uh, but, you know, it's, I, I, like, I hear these little snippets that kind of help put in perspective, but it, it, it's always a struggle no matter what, right? Yeah, I, so well said. And I love that you talked, I love that you used an example of a concert with 30,000 people. Like, I have a lot of respect for Frank in, in this regard because there's a certain percentage of people that are just cruel and, like, like fucking with you. And, like, like that's how they live. And the more you scale, the bigger that, like, the more individuals are in that percentage group. The way that I deal with that as an artist, I, I, it's a little easier for me because I'm just making art um, and, and I'm pretty small scale. But, like, I, I think this is, goes across my life in general with negativity and people that are, you know, being haters or, or, or being saying damaging things is like, you just, just don't give it oxygen. Don't give it sunlight. It'll die on the vine. And, but the more you like focus on it and try to attack it and, and defend yourself and respond, like you're just feeding it. It's like, it's, it's almost like a, you know, a cancer. It's like growing. It's like, you just gotta like cut it off from its life force. And um, it's, it's almost, or like another analogy maybe is like itching a mosquito bite. It's just like, it'll itch for a bit and then it goes away. But if you keep itching it, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So just like ignore the haters and focus on that core community of people. Um, the other thing I, I'd say is just like, uh, as much as you can, under promise, over deliver. Um, I, I really, when I release projects, I'm like, this is my art project. And people are like, what's the roadmap? Or like, what can we expect from this? I'm like, you're buying art. And then once they buy it, I'm like, okay, now there's a game I'm gonna do with Drive, for example. Or like, I'm like, now, okay, if you hold a drip drop, you get you first dibs on my edition drop or something like that. But I never say it beforehand. And, and what that does is it costs me some hype, but it gives me longevity. And it, and it, it and I like it, it completely like segments me from people being able to criticize and be like, is like being like, you didn't show up in this moment in, in this way that you promised you would. I'm like, I'm, I'm selling art. And then as much as I can to the best of my ability, ability to deliver with the proper energy, I will over deliver. And that, that's my two cents on that. Yeah, for me, <laughs> um, you know, I, the first year of D gods was, I was anonymous. I would come to panels like this and be wearing a Bitcoin mask and, and we had, had really bad times and also had really good times throughout that process. And so I, I do feel like the most frustrating part that people sometimes don't realize the bigger you get, especially in this like micro niche called crypto today is the worst feeling is when people just are spreading lies 
and that gets traction because people want to believe that. And so I think there's like a version of Frank that's out there that is this like compendium of all these different stories that honestly have no validity that like to your point early days, I would try to like counteract it and say like, no, this is not true or whatever. But at a certain point, it's like, what am I going to do? Post my oxygen logs for the last like two years to prove that I didn't have this conversation with that person. You know, it's like you can't even prove some some lies to be uh, false. And so now I, I do think I don't have the best answer to this, but I, I talk to the team all the time. It, it sounds cheesy, but we just try to like do everything with really high integrity. Like if there was a judge or if there was a person that was going to go back to everything that we did, like, do we have a good reason why we did it? Do we have good intentions around it? And at, at the end of the day, like, can I fucking sleep at night? Like, are we making the right call? And that's meant that we've made a lot less money than we could have over the last year or two. It means that, you know, we've made some decisions that made it a lot more difficult for us. But all of it, the thing that keeps me the most calm is I think NFTs are going to be fucking massive. And everyone's all doom and gloom right now. And I'm like, no, guys, it's not even about like gaming or this or that. It's like digital collectibles, just digital goods. I like digital objects to your point man, like I'm 24 right now. So maybe it's just supernatural to me, but I, like, it's just obvious to me that kids, adults are going to want to buy things like on the internet and they might not even exist in the physical world. And I think we are so early and in such a great spot in, in, in the long term that uh, I'm just great. The, the simplest answer is I'm just grateful. Like, holy fuck. We have people that care about what we're doing. You know, we get a, as many shots on goal as long as we stay alive and we're going to, we're going to keep staying alive. And so I'm grateful to be in this industry and I want to be in it for, it's like what you said earlier, it's for the rest of my fucking life. So who, who gives a shit? Yeah. There it is. Everybody give it up for our incredible panelists.